Mitch. Um. There we go. All right, Adam and Abigail are here. And sorry, guys. It takes me a few minutes to get like everything pulled up. I need. This and I need it over here. So, um, like I said, you should have something. We'll get on the computers here in a minute. I just want to go over things real quick again. Um, were you two online at all? Did y'all join the Zoom? Okay, yeah, that's why I thought I thought y'all were there. I just can't remember because, like I said, it's it's hard to remember who's on Zoom, who's in the class, and everything else. But um, let's see. All right. We'll see who's. There's somebody that's supposed to be here today, and I'm assuming they just went online. I guess. Is there anybody? Oh, we got five people. Okay, Zane. Yeah, yeah. We go to lunch at. Uh, twelve fifteen, I think. No, not twelve fifteen. Uh, one fifteen or one and five. I can pull it up. That probably be better. For me. Oh goodness. Here's your screen. Activation required. All right, y'all go ahead and get to a computer. Um, you can use your personal devices or you can just go get on a computer. Make sure you're getting on a computer that has white tape on it. Um, that's the main thing you need to make sure you're doing. Um, so, it's, oh, excuse me, they don't have one. One that doesn't have blue tape, that's the one you can get on. Let me clean off the disk from. I got a system going pretty well now. Um, so those of you online on Zoom, uh, the main thing you want to do is try to pull up your lab sim. If it's not working, we're going to try to go through that together right now. So just kind of relax with us and we're going to get that all figured out. Uh, you might have to try to confuse that one. Alright, just bear with me, people online. We're kind of getting things ready to go. I'm learning this new program slash website. Alright, it's not. They're doing it over there. What's up? Do it with him? Yeah, like what? You already know what you're down. You should probably try to get into Lab Sim. You should be have a login now. Um, the login again is. Um, Password for now was C E T F twenty twenty. Teachers at this time, if you haven't already done so, left forty five, you can go ahead and let the A group students go to lunch at this time. A group students will report for lunch. We'll have teachers who have third period planning in the hallway and also in the cafeteria to make sure that they are six feet apart with their mask on. But again, though, at this time, if you haven't already done so, a group will go to lunch. B group, you're on standby until the 105 bell. Thank you. There you go.
Yep, one of both. Do I what now? Go to Lab Sim. You should have an account now. Um, Abigail, is it? I saw your email. So is it not allowing you to access the class? I I can't access anything on it. Like it just shows me that I'm enrolled, and that's it. That did it. Can you try now again, maybe? I don't know if it did work or not. Well, there's something new on the screen, so I'd assume so, I guess. Maybe. That's <laughs> um, hang on. Yes. Yes, there is something now. Okay, we're good. Okay, cool. How about everybody else? Are y'all good? Y'all can give me a thumbs up. I don't know how y'all do that, but if you can give me a thumbs up that y'all have gotten in. All right, Adam's good. This was good. Your login is your email, and the password is CETF2020. Everything's all caps. All right, so then if we're all good, then we can start going through this. And honestly, if y'all are cool, then I'll just go through this first lab together with you. You can still do it, um, and we can go from there. Um, if that works for y'all. You should have gotten something in your email, but I will, yeah, I'll go ahead and put a link to Lab Sim in uh, Canvas because that probably would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Do it now? You should be able to after you sign in that first time. Yes, sir. I'm about to share. Okay, uh, and for everyone here and online, um, here's how it's going to work from here on out. I'm going to have basically a module at the top that's going to be your links you need to use. Um, so, for instance, I have your link for LabSim down here. I'll put it in one moment real quick. Uh, I'll share my screen here in a second. All right, that should work. So now that everyone's in and knows how to get in, let me share the screen. Okay, so this is, if you go to just our homepage, for instance, you'll see our modules. And now I have Zoom link and LabSim. I'm even going to edit that real quick and just change it to and Lab. So now you know that if you're trying to get on our Zoom or if you're trying to get on uh, LabSim, you can do that. Also, I'm going to record um, most of our meetings um, for now, but after a while, I'm not going to be recording them anymore. I will be on Zoom, but I'm not going to be posting them on YouTube. I'm not going to be worrying about that. But for now, if you miss something or want to go back, you can click on this link. For some reason, my YouTube uh, little picture I had is not working. But you can see each uh, class so far. So you can see uh, our CET Day 1 class, which has a nice um, picture of me in the, um, what is that called? I can't even think of the name. The, the what now? The thumbnail. Thank you. I couldn't think of it. And now this is CET Day 2, Part 1 and Part 2. It, it got chopped into two parts. So um, you can go there to see that. Um, today will probably be uploaded to YouTube and there'll be more days where they're uploaded to YouTube, but some days there won't be. If y'all are just working through LabSim, I'm not necessarily going to record it because there's no point. Y'all are just working through assignments in LabSim. Um, you three were able to get in? Can you see the course? If you click on that blue link to it. Yep, that's it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to go through this first lab together. Is that cool with everyone at home? That's what we're going to do. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen now. 
So we watched that video on the first day. You want me to turn off the lights? Maybe easier for y'all to see. Um, so oh, I don't think y'all are seeing what I'm, I'm showing, are you? There you go. You should be able to see it now. Um, so everything I just showed didn't show up. So let me go back there real quick. Again, um, this is your, if you come to home, you see the Zoom and Lab Sim, and you come on this page, there's our Zoom link. This is the link to YouTube. For some reason, my picture's not showing up. I might have to change that. And then down here is the Lab Sim link. And whenever you need to get the Lab Sim, you can go to that. Or you can honestly Google Lab Sim, and it comes up. I need that to go away. Go away. Okay. So, again, we went through this, the demo work with components. Uh, we even watched a video about um, uh, the beginning of computers and stuff on that first day. So this is kind of the entire course. It's a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a lot. There's a lot going on in this course. We're going to watch a lot of videos because I'm not going to lie to you. I don't, I'm not the, an expert on this material. I'm interested in it, probably like a lot of you. Um, like Wesley, you told me the other day you've built a computer, so you, you're a step farther than I have. I've tinkered with stuff, obviously, but I'm not an expert. So we're going to be learning this together. Um, there's a whole bunch of new curriculum, so any business class you're going into right now, for instance, even the Adobe classes, we're not experts in Adobe. I'm definitely more of an expert in Adobe than I am with computer engineering, but that's what I'm just saying. We're doing all these new curriculums, so bear with us as we kind of learn them with you. Um, we're going to different trainings on them, and we're getting as good as we can get with them for the most part. So um, the cool thing is this has actually got some cool stuff. The videos do kind of suck, not going to lie. Uh, but, you know, we're going to get through them. So uh, we are going to go to, we did this on the, you know, introduction. We did this, the simulator, and it showed us how to work the simulator. Uh, and then this is the first lab. So I'm going to do this on the screen. And this is the first time, I, this is probably the only time I'm going to do this. Because after we do this one lab, kind of be showing you and you doing it at home or in here you should be good like i shouldn't have to i mean if there's a lab that's really hard we'll do it together but as of right now i'm planning on y'all can probably do these labs without me going over it i'm going to be doing them with you but i don't have to waste your time by doing it up here and then you doing it again so you start the lab and it's going to take you to this other screen and it'll take a few minutes and this is the exact same video we watched too so i'm just kind of re-emphasizing if you weren't online if you weren't here or something so they give us this desktop. You can scroll out by using the uh, mouse scroll. Um, and basically our first objective is to add the monitor. So we're going to come to monitors and add that over here somewhere. I like the sound effects it has. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is connect the monitor to the computer using HDMI cable. So we're going to go find cables. And we have an HDMI cable, so I'm going to put it on the table over here. I can flip to the back of the computer if I scroll over here and I'm seeing the back of the computer and I need to see also the back of the monitor so I'm gonna put one end I need to scroll in a little bit here there's my HDMI port and then I need to go over and scroll in and there's my other HDMI input so I'm gonna put it over here and now I've at least got that connection. So I've connected my HDMI cord where it needs to go. I think everyone should have a basic understanding of HDMI cords, right? Now, I, the, one of the other things I need to do is connect to the power. So I'm going to connect one end to my plug right here. Oh, I didn't get it. I need this one right here. And then I need to choose this one right here, and I can plug it into the wall right here. Um, and sometimes you're going to have a, uh, you should have a surge protector sometimes, but, oh, there it is. I was like, it should be over here. And you're going to plug this into your surge protector. And now I'm going to flip it back to the front. I'm going to flip this back to the front. And I'm going to turn on the monitor of the computer. And if I scroll in right here, there's the button. And it's saying there's no connection, but that's because I have not turned on the computer. And now you can start working on the inside of the computer, which is kind of cool. So that'll work like that. It'll log you in. 
Um, and that's fine. It didn't even say we had to turn on the computer, or it did say turn on the monitor and the computer. We've done that. We hit score lab. And just like that, I got a pass. I got 100%. Did everyone see how that worked? Do we not see how that worked? Well, were we paying attention or were we trying to play in the lab ourselves? Both. Both, yeah, we, we weren't fully paying attention. Okay, so what we'll do is, I'll do it one more time. Make sure you're paying attention. Start lab. So over here is kind of your shelf, right? So that's going to be where all of your materials that you need are at. So you've got your cables and you've got a monitor. And if in future labs, there might be tons of other things. You know, there might be pieces of the computer. There might be computers itself in the shelf. So we're first thing it asks us to do. So, but if you do want to read the scenario in this lab, you learn how to use the test out simulator. You are the IT administrator for a small corporate network. You're working on a computer in your office. So you're putting your computer together in your office. As you can see, we need a monitor. And I add that in. And it says next to connect the monitor to the component using HDMI. So I go and go to my cables. I can read right here that it says HDMI, right? I'm going to bring that over to the table over here. It said I can't connect it there, obviously. I need to flip. I use the back so I can see the motherboard even here. I can see the drive bays, and I can see the back and the front. But right now, all I need is the back. So I'm going to put one end right there, and I'm going to put one end in the back of my monitor, which, whoops, where'd it go? I lost it. And one end right there. So these are all connected now. So next, I need the power cord, which I put one end in here. And it's going to ask me if I don't select the right one, which one do I want if I haven't selected one. So I want the AC power connector female. And I want the AC power connector male version to go into my uh, surge protector. So once I've done that, I have done everything I was supposed to, except for the last step of turning on the monitor so I can click on it. And lastly, turning on the computer. And there we go. And if I hit score lab, I get 100. Does that make sense now? All right. So I'm going to give you all five or ten minutes to get through that first lab. Even you at home, get through that first lab, get it finished up. And then we're going to move on to the next video we have to watch. All right, David, so you finished? Awesome. Connor, how we come? How do you connect? Which thing? On the monitor, it's on the right bottom corner. So you need to select that and so you can back to the monitor. Can you see where the problems are on the back of the monitor? Get them out of there. Like the radio. 
Everybody at home finished? If you're not, speak now. All right, I think we're good. Okay, so we're going to move on, and I need y'all to make sure you're paying attention to this next video. This is how to work on the internal components of the computer. This one is about nine minutes long, so it's going to be a little while, but that's okay. You might have to install, replace, or upgrade internal computer components within a lab. So let's take a few minutes to look at how you work with internal components in the lab simulator. Notice that we have a button here called Motherboard. If we click on it, we see the motherboard within the system. Clicking on the Motherboard button is equivalent to removing the system case cover on a real computer and looking inside of it. There are three main areas within the computer. We have the power supply down here, the motherboard itself is in this area, and to the right, we have our drive base. This is where we can install optical drives, hard disk drives, and so on. Let's take a look at each of these areas in a little more detail. We'll start with the power supply. Notice that on the back of the power supply, there's a bundle of wires. And on these wires are the various connectors that are used by the internal components within the computer. With the power supply selected, I can go down here to the selected components window, and it shows me all of the various connectors that are available on this power supply. For example, we have our main motherboard connector. We have our four pin and eight pin CPU connectors, and we have our SATA connectors. If I wanted to install a component into this case, and that component required power from the power supply, I would look down here at the selected components window to look at each connector's thumbnail and figure out which one I should use. If you need more information about a particular connector, you can click on its details link and additional information will be displayed. For example, we can view the back, the front, and the top of the main motherboard connector. Underneath each connector, we see its status, whether it's connected to something or whether it's unconnected. This one is currently unconnected, but if it is connected to something, the status is shown right here. For example, we see that the CPU power connector is connected to the motherboard. Right now, the system won't power on without the main motherboard power connector. So to connect it to the motherboard, we can click on it and drag it to the appropriate connector. Let it go, and now the connector's status has changed. It's connected to the motherboard as well as the CPU connector. In addition to the power supply area, we also have the motherboard area. You'll spend a lot of time in this area. This simulated motherboard has all the sockets that you will see on a real motherboard. It has a socket for the CPU, it has memory slots, it has storage connectors for our SATA drives. It has expansion slots. You'll use these slots to customize the motherboard according to the scenario's requirements. For example, over here on the shelf, I have a category called memory modules. One of the tasks in the scenario directs us to install a memory module in an open memory slot. To do this, I grab the memory module from the shelf and then I drag it to the appropriate location on the motherboard. Notice that as I do this, a blue box appears that tells me that this is a possible location where I could connect the memory module. In addition to the memory slots, it also highlights a PCI slot and a PCIe slot. You can't install a memory module in a PCI or a PCIe slot. It's just telling me that it is an option. It's not the right option, but it's an option. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to connect it to the correct slot. I'm going to drag the memory module over a memory slot and then release the mouse and the memory module is now installed in that slot. If you tried to connect this memory module to the wrong connector, for example, if I were to pull it out of the memory slot and try to drop it into my PCIe slot, an error is going to be generated, and it tells you, hey, you can't connect that device here. We can do the same thing with an expansion card. If we expand the network adapter category, we see that I have a network card on the shelf. To install it, I drag it over to the appropriate slot on the motherboard. This is a PCIe card, so I'll drop it on a PCIe slot. I'm going to hide this scenario so we have a little more room to work. 
I'm going to zoom in a little on the motherboard now. In addition to providing slots for memory expansion cards, there's also other active connectors on the motherboard. And you can see those connectors here. There are several SATA connectors down here that I can use to connect SATA devices to the system. Over here, we have front panel connectors that we can use to connect the power switch, the hard disk LED light, and so on to the motherboard. Don't worry about being able to decipher all of these connectors on the motherboard by the abbreviations you see printed on the motherboard itself because there are many different areas on the motherboard. And because every motherboard is different, you're not expected to identify each of these different connectors and memorize its location. That would probably be impossible. In real life, the connectors on the motherboard vary depending on the motherboard manufacturer and the motherboard's model number. So to help you identify where the different connectors are on the motherboard, most motherboards come with documentation and you can review the documentation to determine what connectors are where. Well, we can do the same thing here in this simulated environment. To read the documentation for the motherboard, click on the motherboard itself, as I've done here. And when I do, notice that the motherboard appears in the selected components window. To view the documentation for the board, click on the details link. When I do, notice that the top view of the motherboard is displayed, and if I needed to, I could zoom in and out to see the various connectors on the motherboard. But more importantly, over here is the specifications tab. If I click on the specifications tab, an overview of the motherboard is displayed. If I scroll down here, a graphic is displayed here with the numbers that are used to identify each of the connectors on the motherboard. I'll scroll down a little farther, and here we have a legend that matches a description to each number. For example, notice that there's a number right here on this connector. If I scroll down the legend, I see that this is my CPU over voltage jumper. In addition to a diagram identifying various parts of the motherboard, there's typically additional documentation on the specifications tab that provides you with detailed information about various other aspects of the board itself, such as what kind of processor it supports, what kind of memory the board supports, and other configuration information that you'll need in order to work with this motherboard. For example, over here, it tells me this motherboard uses an LGA CPU socket. If I scroll down farther, there's more details about this socket. We also have a heading for system memory. Here it says that this motherboard comes with four DDR4 DIMM sockets. Down here, it tells us some recommended memory configurations. If we had just one DIMM that we want to install, it tells us where we can install it. If we want to configure it to operate in dual channel mode, then it tells us how the memory modules need to be installed. Let's close this window. Now be aware that in addition to the connectors on the power supply and the motherboard, there may be other connectors that are part of the system case itself. Let's zoom out just a little bit so we can see what we're doing. Let's select the case, not the motherboard, but the actual case. Notice that it's outlined now. And down here in the selected components window, we see all the various connectors that are used to connect the system case to the motherboard. We have our power switch. We have the power LED light. We have a hard disk light. We have the speaker connector and so on. The third area of the case that you need to be familiar with is the drive bay area over here located in the right of the system. The drive bay holds your DVD drives, your Blu-ray drives, hard disk drives, and so on. If I were to look at the front of the computer by clicking on front, you would see that there is currently a DVD drive installed in the system. To get a better view of how this drive is installed in the system, I need to click the drive bays button. When I do, you see that I have an optical drive installed. Now, you'll note that while the optical drive is visible from the front view, the hard drive is not you can only see it from the drive bay's view. It's important to note that if you need to work with these drives in the system, for example, installing a drive in a particular bay, you have to do it from the drive bay's view. It's not possible to move the drive to a different bay from the front view. If I go back to drive bays, I can click on the optical drive and I can move it to a different bay. And now if I look at the front, we can see that the optical drive has been moved down. When you're working with drive bays, one of the key things that you need to be aware of is how to manage the cable connectors. Most likely, the scenario is going to require us to connect this optical drive to the motherboard with a data cable and the power supply with a power connector. Let's begin by talking about how to supply power to this optical drive. Over here, under partial connections, we have a picture of our power supply. If we click on the power supply, a list of all the connectors on the power supply are displayed. One of them is an unconnected SATA connector. All you have to do is drag it and drop it onto the power connector. The data cable will require a little more work. 
I'm going to click and drag the data cable over onto the SATA connector on the optical drive. Now one end is connected and the other is not. We'll need to switch back to the motherboard view and then drag the unconnected end over to the appropriate connector on the motherboard. And now we see that one end is connected to the drive and the other end is connected to the motherboard. That's it for this demonstration. In this demo, we talked about working with internal components. We reviewed the three main areas within the computer that you'll work with. We looked at the power supply area and the main board area, and then we ended this demonstration by looking at the drive base. All right, sorry for the long video. It's just the first of many to come though. All right, so that being said, let's move on to the next thing. We have another lab that basically is going to do exactly what they just did. So we're looking at this computer right here, and we are going to need, uh, we're still working with that IT company. Um, in the lab, your task is to complete the following. So from the shelf, install the memory module in an open memory slot. So we need to look at our motherboard view again. And this is our memory slot, right? Right there. Right here, this is our memory slot on the motherboard. This is the one we want, and we're going to put it in here, and it's there. All right, from the shelf, install the network card in an open PCIe slot. So this is our network, um, yeah, this is our network card, and all we have left is one cable, so we're kind of running out of things to install. Uh, and it was right, I'm put it right there. There we go, yeah. So we put in our network card. Uh, from the shelf, connect the SATA cable to the data connection to the CD drive, um, the top connect object in the drive bay. So, so we're gonna get this. And we're gonna put one right here. And we're gonna put the other end in the drive bay. They said at the for the shelf the, the top object in the drive bay. Is there? No. Where's that? I gotta get it. Okay. Oh, gonna, oh, that was the one that's connected, isn't it? That's why. For some reason, I'm having a hard time here. There we go. I just wasn't getting the right thing. Okay, so now we've connected that. The what now? Which one? The this end of it. That's in the motherboard, and it's right here. All right, so that's into our. Um, So we connect to the data connection to the CD drive. Does that make sense? Right? All right, so now we're looking at the power supply. And just like they did in the video, we are going to connect that to the motherboard. If I'm not mistaken, we connect that. Who was that connect that right here? No. I might need a refresher myself now. How do we connect this? Oh, I know now. It's a. Uh, oh, that's what I wanted. Well, we connected up here. There we go. All right, so now we've connected the power supply to the motherboard. From the power supply, plug a 15 pin SATA power connector into the power connector on the CD drive on the left side of the drive. So from the power supply, pretty sure right here. Is this one connected? Yeah, that one's connected. I need a minute. That's my bad, guys. 
from the power supply plug a 15 pin is into the power connector from the speed jack. Well, do I have more? I don't have any more tools, do I? No, I don't have any more. Okay, have we done everything then? Because we connected the SATA drive cables to the kernel drive. Let's connect to the hard drive. They all seem to be connected. That's connected now. Oh wait, here it is. The connector. We're gonna bring that over. We'll connect that right here, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. So we did that. We got the 15-pin connector. Uh. What's that? And now we want to connect the CD drive. We did that. That's connected. Is that all I gotta do? I feel like I'm missing a step. I may have connected the wrong one. No, I did the 20 pin. I'm gonna score the lab just see. I'm thinking I'm missing something. Not pass. Uh, verify that the computer. Wow, I didn't do that. Okay, make sure you turn your computer on. I did do it all correctly. I just forgot to turn on the computer. So make sure you turn on your computer before you get done. And if you get that test out screen, you should be good. And hit score. Let's make sure you did it. Yeah, I got 100%, but I didn't turn on the power. You got it? Okay, so there's that. So we've got through another lab.
And this is how we're going to work on this for now. Um, eventually, I'm going to kind of let y'all do it on your own and kind of just let you go through it, and I'll be here to help. Um, so we basically did that one. And now we're going to go through hardware basics. So as you study this section, uh, answer the following questions. What is the difference between hardware, software, and firmware? I think we can all kind of answer this for the most part. You know, your programs and everything are your software, and your hardware is your actually actual computer, keyboards, things like that. So which type of device uses USB ports? What are common input and output devices? What is the definition of processing? What is the most common types of storage devices? Why is it important to, uh, why is it important to increase uh, uh, components? I can't read. Competization and standardization. Uh, in this section, you will learn to identify common I.O. ports by sight, um, connect common uh, peripherals to standard ports. So these are some of the terms. You're probably going to want to go back and study these a little bit. Um, these right here, given a scenario, install components with the display and laptop. So these are some of the objectives we're going to have, and we're going to go through these things now. All right, so computer basics. Let's play this video. It's 10 minutes a little long, but we're going to have to get through it. As a PC technician, it's very important that you understand the basic components that make up a computer. Computers are made up of constituent parts that work together to create a functional computer. These parts can be divided into two main categories, hardware and software. Hardware refers to the physical components that are installed inside or connected to a computer system. By itself, hardware can't do much. It needs instructions to tell it what to do. These instructions come from the software. Software refers to instructions or data that are stored electronically, either on a hard drive or on a special chip. Hardware without software is kind of like a car without a driver. A car has the potential to drive, but it needs a driver in order to see the potential. Without a driver, the car can't do anything. The same is true with hardware. Hardware has a lot of potential, but it needs software to instruct it to use that potential. The main thing to remember is that hardware is the potential. Software is the instruction. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the different types of hardware devices that compose a computer system. The first type of hardware device we'll look at is input devices. An input device is any piece of hardware that takes information from outside the computer and transfers it inside where the computer hardware can use it. The most common input device is a keyboard. A keyboard takes user inputs and sends them as electrical signals to the internal computer hardware where they are processed. When a key on a keyboard is pressed, an internal chip called a scanning chip identifies which key was pressed and then sends the appropriate code to the computer. The code could generate a letter in a Word document, a number in a spreadsheet, or a command for the computer. Another very common input device is a mouse. A mouse also uses inputs and sends them as electrical signals to the computer, but it does so a bit differently. A mouse tracks movements as XY coordinates. These coordinates are sent to the computer, which causes the mouse pointer to move in the same manner. The way a mouse tracks movement depends on the type of mouse being used. The most common type is an optical mouse. An optical mouse uses a light source and a sensor to track movement. A less common type is a mechanical mouse. A mechanical mouse uses a track ball, which rolls when the mouse is moved, along with sensors to identify which direction the ball rolls. Chances are you are very familiar with using these two input devices. Another input device you are probably familiar with is a touchscreen. If you've used a smartphone, tablet, or a computer kiosk, you've used a touchscreen. Instead of key presses or movement tracking, a touchscreen takes user input from screen taps. There are two main touchscreen technologies, resistive and capacitive. Resistive touchscreens use two flexible layers that are separated by a gap. Inside the gap is an electrical current. When the screen is tapped, the outer layer depresses and contacts the inner layer, creating an electrical signal that identifies XY coordinates. The coordinates are then sent to the computer. Capacitive touchscreens use a screen that is coated with a conductive material. An electrical current is then run through the material. When something conductive touches the screen, such as a finger, small sensors identify the touch and generate XY coordinates. Capacitive touchscreens are used on smartphones, tablets, and some laptops. But because they require a conductive touch, a non-conductive object, such as gloves or plastic, can't be used to tap the screen. Resistive touchscreens are typically used for airport or library kiosks. Because they require only pressure, any rigid object can be used to tap the screen. Now, signals generated by input devices need to be analyzed. This is done by using a processing device. 
A processing device is any hardware component that can analyze and interpret input information. The most common processing device is the central processing unit, or CPU. The CPU is like the brains of the computer. It processes data according to a set of instructions or software. For example, when the A key on the keyboard is pressed, the keystroke information is sent to the CPU where it's processed based on the software that's currently running. If we were running word processing software, the letter A would appear at the cursor location in the open document. But if we were running a game, it might make the character move to the left. Another processing device is random access memory, or RAM. RAM is used to store processed information so it can be quickly accessed at a later time. For example, if a CPU were to process data from a spreadsheet software, but still needed to access that data at a later time, the data could be stored in RAM for quick access. RAM is also used to store running software. RAM can also be considered a hardware component called a storage device. A storage device is any hardware component that stores data, either temporarily or permanently. When data is stored temporarily, short-term storage, such as RAM, is used. It's important to know that RAM is considered volatile memory. It's not persistent. This means that when the power source is lost, for example, the computer is turned off, all the data that was stored in RAM is lost. It's gone forever. Now, you might be wondering why we would use a storage device that is erased every time it loses power. Well, the reason we use RAM is because it's extremely fast. Information can be accessed from RAM faster than any other type of storage hardware. But sometimes we need to store information permanently. This is done using long-term storage. Remember, short-term storage is lost every time the computer is shut down. Long-term storage, however, is considered non-volatile memory. It's persistent. This means that even when the computer is turned off, the data stored on the hardware will still be there when we turn the computer back on. There are a variety of long-term storage media. The most common one is a hard disk drive. Hard disk drives store information on rotating disks called platters. Another common medium is a solid state drive or SSD. SSDs use memory chips that are a lot like RAM. However, the information stored on these chips is persistent. Hard disk drives and SSDs can store a lot of data and access it relatively fast, but not nearly as fast as RAM. This is why we use both hard drives and RAM to store data. We also have optical storage media, such as CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs. Now, optical storage media can either be read-only or writable. If a disc is read-only, the information it contains is fixed and can't be modified or erased. It can only be viewed. An example of a read-only disc is a software CD-ROM or DVD-ROM. The ROM at the end actually stands for read-only memory. Writable discs, on the other hand, can be modified. Discs that are writable have an R or an RW at the end. For example, CDR, DVDRW, DDR. The R stands for recordable. Unlike their ROM counterparts, these types of discs can have information saved to them. There are two more long-term storage devices we need to talk about. The first is a flash drive. Flash drives are small, portable devices that use memory chips to store information. These memory chips are very similar to RAM chips. However, the information is persistent. The second is a secure digital or SD card. You might be familiar with these. SD cards are used in smartphones, tablets, and digital cameras to store information. They use non-volatile memory. Now, all the information that is being input, processed, and stored on a computer is useless unless there is a way to access and view it. This is done by using an output device. An output device is any device that receives data from a computer and outputs it in a physical medium. The most common output device is a monitor. Monitors are used to visually depict the data that is processed by the CPU. Whether it's numbers being calculated in a spreadsheet or aliens running around in a video game, a monitor displays a visual representation of the information being processed. Another very common output device is a printer. Printers take information that is processed by the CPU and print it on a piece of paper. Both monitors and printers output visual information, but there are more than just visual output devices. For example, another output device is a sound card. Sound cards take digital information and output it as audible signals. Almost all computers have some sort of audio output device. Now, all the devices we've talked about so far communicate information within a single computer. However, there are other hardware components that allow information to be communicated between multiple computers. These are known as networking devices. Networking devices are used to create networks. A 
A network is a group of two or more computers that are connected together. To create a network, a special interface is installed in a computer. A connecting medium is then used to connect the computers together. This connecting medium can be a physical wire or even radio signals. With this connection established, these two computers can take information being processed by the CPU and send it to each other. This makes networking hardware both input and output devices. When one computer is outputting information, the other is inputting information and vice versa. Now there's one more aspect of computer hardware that we need to talk about called modular design. Modular design is a design approach that standardizes hardware interfaces in order to create modular hardware components. This means that a monitor that works on one computer can be connected to a different computer and still work. The monitor is modular. While this may seem commonplace today, it wasn't always the case. In the early days of computers, hardware components were actually proprietary. This meant that if a piece of hardware in your computer died, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a replacement. You actually had to ship the component, sometimes the entire computer, back to the manufacturer in order to get it fixed or replaced. Luckily, this isn't the case anymore. Because computer hardware is modular and standardized, you aren't limited to specific manufacturer or brands when buying or replacing hardware components. For example, if you want to install another hard disk drive in your computer, you don't have to buy it from the same company that built your computer. Any brand of hard disk drive will work. So those are the basic hardware components of the computer system. Remember, there are two main computer component categories, hardware and software. Hardware is the potential, software is the instruction. In this lesson, we looked at the various hardware components that comprise a computer based on the five main functions they perform, input, processing, storage, output, and networking. Okay. Well, that's that lab. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go over this real quick. Um, so after that, so how long is this video? It's five minutes. Okay. Let's go through this. We'll watch the five minute and fifty second video, and then we're done for the day. Sound good? Oh, that's a deal. Everybody at home cool with that? I think so. All right, so computers are made of several uh, constituent components. These components can be divided into two main categories, as we talked about hardware, software. Uh, there's different types of input, as you can see, um, processing, there's CPU and RAM. Uh, storage devices, there's hard disk, solid state disk, uh, solid state drives optical drives, and flash drives. The process of computer uh, presenting, displaying, or otherwise getting data, that is output, uh, network, and communication. I will say you might want to go back through and kind of study over these pages eventually. We will probably have like a quiz or a test on these at some point, um, and you'll just have to take it either from home or in here. So just be prepared for that. Okay. Let's play this video, and by that time, it'll be getting closer to 12.50, and um, you can kind of explore through the course a little bit more if you'd like. How's that sound? Computers use a variety of ports in order to connect external input and output devices. In this lesson, we're going to look at some of the more common ports used by computers. Here's a diagram of the back of a desktop computer. Notice all the different ports down here. Let's take a look at each of these starting on the left. These two ports here are called PS2 ports and are used to connect a keyboard and a mouse. PS2 ports are actually part of a family of connectors called mini DIN connectors. Their technical name is actually a mini DIN 6 port, but they're typically called PS2 ports. Notice how these ports are different colors. The majority of desktop computers use colors to denote the type of device that connects to the port. For example, the purple PS2 port means this is the keyboard port. The green means this is the mouse port. Occasionally, you might encounter a PS2 port that is half purple, half green. This means that the port can be used for either a keyboard or a mouse. 
Know that not all computers use color-coded ports. Sometimes ports will be black with small icons to identify the ports. Sometimes the port won't have any identifier. To the right of the PS2 ports, we have a few ports we'll talk about as a group. These ports are all different types of video ports and are used to output display information. This is a VGA port. It sends an analog video signal to an external display. Next is a digital video interface, or DVI port. Unlike VGA ports, DVI ports are able to send a digital signal to an external display, resulting in a much higher quality image. These next two video ports also send a digital signal. The top port is an HDMI port. HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface. The one below it is a display port. The cool thing about these ports is that in addition to a digital video signal, they can also send a digital audio signal. This is great for connecting a computer to a TV. You can identify HDMI ports and display ports by their shape. HDMI ports are symmetrical. Both bottom corners are beveled. Display ports are asymmetrical. Only one corner is beveled. You are most likely familiar with these next ports. These four ports here are USB ports. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus. USB ports are extremely versatile. They can be used to connect a mouse, keyboard, printer, digital camera, external hard drive, the list goes on and on. USB ports can be identified by their rectangular shape and the inside tab here. This tab prevents a USB plug from being inserted incorrectly. Notice this pair of USB ports is a different color. There are actually different versions of the USB standard. The blue identifies these ports as USB 3.0 ports, which are able to transfer information at a much faster rate than the black ones here. This port here is a FireWire port, also called an IEEE 1394 port. FireWire ports can connect much of the same devices that USB ports connect. However, USB ports are used much more often. FireWire ports can be identified by the rectangular shape that has one beveled side. These next ports we'll also talk about as a group. These highlighted ports are different types of audio ports. These two ports here are called SPDIF ports. SPDIF stands for Sony Philips Digital Interface Format. SPDIF ports transmit a high quality digital audio signal. Notice the different connector types. This port here is a coaxial SPDIF port and uses a coaxial connector. This port over here is a fiber SPDIF port and uses a fiber optic connector. These ports here are also audio ports, but they transmit analog audio signal. The ports themselves are called audio jacks. Audio jacks are typically color coded. The blue jack is the line in port. The line in port is used to transmit an audio signal into the computer, where it can be played by the computer speakers. For example, you could plug in a radio and play it through your computer. The green jack is the line out port. This is used to connect speakers to the computer. The pink jack is the microphone port and is used to connect a microphone in order to record audio. Now, most of the time you only encounter these three audio jacks on the left here. However, higher end motherboards will also have these two jacks, which are used with surround sound devices. The black jack is for connecting rear speakers and the orange jack is for the subwoofer. The next connector we'll look at is the ethernet port. Ethernet ports are used to connect a computer to a network. Ethernet ports use RJ45 connectors to connect to the network. Most new motherboards have one or more built-in Ethernet ports. The last port we'll talk about isn't used as much as it used to be. It's been replaced by most of the ports we've already talked about. It's the serial port, which is the port right here. The serial port, also called a DB9 connector, has nine pins. The D in DB comes from the characteristic D shape of the port. Serial ports are used to connect serial devices, such as a barcode scanner. They look similar to VGA ports, but they have only two pin rows, not three. So those are some of the most common ports used by computers. Remember, ports use either colors or icons to help you identify them, but this isn't always the case. Because of this, it's very important that you are able to identify the various ports used by computers by their look. By spending time memorizing these ports, you'll easily be able to identify a DVI port or line out port at a quick glance, which is an invaluable skill. Okay. So next we're going to have, we can kind of go through these things. This is just a review of what she just said. Um, you have your VGA cords. Uh, for instance, I think that's what I'm running to my projector right now. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. 
then you have your DVI ports. We still use that a little bit with some different adapters. Um, we obviously have the high definition uh, multimedia interface, which is HDMI. That is what you use the most now. And there's also the uh, display ports that are very similar to an HDMI. That's what's in the computers now. Um, they don't hold up very well, to be honest with you, the display ports. They haven't been holding up well for us. Um, hopefully these new ones, uh, these new computers have better ones, but we have some that have a little uh, clip, basically. They have a little button you press when you're having to put them in and out. The new ones don't have that, so hopefully that usually has been some of the issue. Also, sometimes the issue has been um, you lift up that back piece on the computer and then it slammed down on them, so that's probably, that might not be the cord's fault. That might be the uh, something slamming down on the cord. So, um, sorry, people online, you may not, I'm kind of referencing something in the class, so you might not be able to see it. Uh, so you got Thunderbolt, uh, combines PCI Express. You've got the separate video, S-video port. Uh, it's used to connect external displays. It has slightly better picture quality than RCA. You have your, oh, two common USB ports. Uh, this is for your mouse, keyboard, digital cameras, printers, scanners, microphones, look at anything under the sun. You can charge your phone using it, obviously. Um, then you've got your different jacks, so you've got speakers, headphones, microphones, audio output devices, so speakers and things like that. Um, green is line out, pink is mic in, blue is line in, orange is subwoofer, and black is rear speakers. So down here we've got uh, uh, coaxial uh, SPDIF uh, port is used to send a digital audio signal to high-end audio devices such as home theater systems uh, or Dolby Digital Surround Sound System. So this is a lot more stuff that you'd have like in a, you know, if you have like a home theater kind of deal. So you got ports, uh, the RJ45 ports, uh, Ethernet networks by connecting multiple computers and networking devices. RJ45 ports have eight connector pins, while you have your uh, RJ11 ports used by telephones and modems to send analog signals ports have for connect pins. So, for instance, we have those in our phones here while this is for the internet. Um, down here, this one's not used as much anymore. The PS2 port, also called the uh, Mini DIN6, is used to connect older uh, keyboards, mouse devices. Um, we still had a few of those laying around here recently, but nothing really takes that much anymore. You usually just use USB. Um, and it's all more common that way. The serial port is used to connect serial devices such as barcode scanners, uh, dial-up modem, or serial mouse. Uh, serial ports are also used to configure and manage some network devices. You've got your uh, parallel, the parallel port connectors, older devices that use parallel. A lot of these are, we're getting into some really old ones now. The DB15 port is used to uh, legacy game pads, joysticks, um, and uh, MIDI devices. So there you go. So yeah, down here were some older ones, kind of, um, and these are the main things you'll see today. Um, VGA is still being used to write a decent amount, but like I said, we're kind of right now, at, at least in our computer labs, we're kind of split between either having VGA or HDMI. Um, we still have a lot of these VGA ports, so if a display port goes bad, we might not have a display port, so we just switched out for a VGA. Um, and honestly, I personally can't tell much of a difference between them. Uh, I think HDMI is obviously supposed to be better with the high def, but with these computers, and it's probably these computers, if you got a better computer, you'd probably be able to tell the difference. But I think with the computers we have at school, I don't think you can really tell the difference in them much. Like in the back, I have that computer has two display ports in the back, and then it has one VGA uh, connector in the back of the computer, which allows me to have three screens. Unfortunately, that computer's not working. I can't log in, so I'm kind of without my three screens. I'm lost. I don't even know what to do anymore. All right. So I'm glad we could go over that really quickly. Um, oh, there's these two. We can do this real quick. I don't want to get as far as we can without, you know, dwelling on it too long. Um, so these are just some um, basically adapters you can see. You can go back through these. These are all, for the most part, video adapters. Um, these are some of the ones we have, for instance, the one I talked about with DVI. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that kind of go to DVI. And then I have one of these. And I tell y'all, these are extremely helpful. Y'all ever, ever have one of these? 
the HDMI to VGA. If you have a projector or something that only has um, VGA cords, then you can put the HDMI from like a game system or something in it. Do wait one now. Yeah, the, the top one. Yeah, anything like that is extremely helpful, especially with the HDMI ports, and then you can, you know, connect things you need to. Um, it makes life a lot easier if you have like something that has VGA or HDMI. And then you've got your um, RJ45 connector to a USB port. I've never had one of those, but that one looks like it would be really helpful. All right, we're not going to watch another video because I don't want to bore you to death today. So I think we're going to basically end it there. Y'all are welcome to kind of look through the course some more now that you finally could get in. Uh, I know you could get in yesterday, but that was kind of late when I finally got the uh, temporary license stuff figured out. So again, just a quick overview. This is where the class is going to be going. Um, right now we're just doing computer overview and we have kind of five subsections to go through this. You need to make sure you have a check mark for all of these. Um, I'm sorry, Patrick, you're probably going to have to go back and do that one lab we did. Um, so you get a check mark. I'm sorry. I know that sucks. Um, but make sure you do that um, so you get a check mark. Uh, it really does suck that they don't just give you, if you got 100%, you completed it. But make sure you follow those directions. And if you, it does say turn on the computer, make sure you see the little window screen. That's what's important. Make sure you see. Yeah, well, it said test out, and then we hit the submit button, and that was partially my fault too. But I want to make sure you have it so when I hit the grade button, it'll, it'll grade it. So just make sure you see the Windows symbol before you finish that. Um, but we're getting close. We have one more video to watch, and then we're going to set up a computer. And we got some practice questions. We might do a quiz or a test next week, maybe middle of next week. I might try to wait until we get through a couple of sections. Uh, how long is this practice question? Okay, so 15. Yeah, we might just do a test. Would y'all rather just do like a little test? Um, I would assume, let's see how long this one is. It's like, well, yeah. So we can just do a like 23 question little test. Um, I'm going to do all my tests as open notes this semester because if you're at home, it's not really fair for the people that are here because um, at home you could cheat and here you wouldn't be able to. Do what now? You have terrible numbers. I know, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do open notes for now. Um, towards the end, when we get towards the end of this class, um, there are certifications, so we're going to try to get those. If you have a test or anything that we have to, we can't obviously use open notes for, then uh, we're going to have to study a little bit harder, and I'll make sure we go through those things, and we'll get through them, and make sure we got it. All right, so that's that's basically it. Like I said, um, you can kind of navigate through the class, kind of see there's a glossary, so you can see all these things. That might be very beneficial later. Um, but I actually kind of really like the setup of this course. It's, it's pretty easy to follow. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anyone in this class was with me for cybersecurity, but that class was a little, uh, it was easy to follow, but it was just kind of jumbled. And this one's a lot more organized. So, all right. So, uh, people online, I am done for the day. Uh, I hope y'all are still there and not died of boredom or just fell asleep watching some videos. But it is important that we do kind of go through all that information. So, let's just make sure. Oh, I got chats. I have just played for I have one. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we are doing, so, I mean, I will say it's kind of cool. We're learning about all these ports, um, stuff, especially stuff you might use, even if you're, you know, plugging in game systems, if you have a gaming computer, things like that. Some of these things are helpful. So, all right. We go to lunch in a few minutes. I'll see everyone online later. Just make sure you've got check marks on all the stuff we did today. And that's the main thing. I'll see y'all later.